Well, as we approach the holiday of Thanksgiving, we're going to take a couple of weeks to talk about giving thanks. Specifically, we're going to make the case, try to make the case for giving thanks in the tough times. I think we'd all agree in principle that it's always good to give thanks in all things, um, even if our circumstances are bad. But are we the type of people who actually do that? Are we the type of people who actually can do that? Uh, and for a lot of us, these are not ideal times. These are tough times. Uh, we could probably give a long list of, of things, disappointments, discouragements from this season. We could probably give a long list of ways that we wish 2020 were different. Um, but it's relatively easy to give thanks in the good times. But God tells us to give thanks in all circumstances. For example, Psalm 106.1, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good, not because our circumstances are what we'd prefer. Because God is good all the time, giving thanks all the time is good. Or Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, <clears throat> with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so the picture there is even when you're casting your anxieties upon God, and you're asking him to change, to act on your behalf, we pepper our petitions with, with thanksgiving. Or one more, 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul wrote, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so how can we actually become the type of people who will give thanks in everything, even when our circumstances are not what we'd prefer? Today we're going to look at a passage that begins to answer that question. It's Luke chapter 17. And what we learn from this passage, we're going to apply it to giving thanks in tough times. Uh, we learn that we have to do two things if we're going to be the type of people who give thanks in the tough times. Number one, we have to think rightly about ourselves. We have to be very clear about who we are uh, as followers of Christ. And then we have to think rightly about God, what type of a master, what type of a Lord he is. And if we're clear on who we are and who God is, then we can be the type of people who give thanks even during the tough times. So today's passage is Luke 17, verses 7 through 19. And I would invite you to stand now, if you would, as I read this passage. <clears throat> Luke 17, beginning in verse 7. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done what was our duty. <clears throat> On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is God's word. Please be seated. <clears throat> so the first paragraph explains how we ought to think about ourselves as disciples if we want to be people who give thanks in the tough times. Notice in verse 7 the scenario that Jesus poses. 
he has his disciples imagine that they had a servant. In other words, Jesus is saying, imagine that you are a farmer and you have a man and he's doing his work. He's working in the field plowing or he's tending sheep. In other words, he's doing what he's supposed to do. And uh, when he comes in from taking, uh, from doing his responsibilities, uh, you don't say to him, come at once and recline at table. I've been home preparing this meal for you. No, you don't say that, right? No, in verse 8 he says, he will, will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink. And so you, if you were a farmer with a servant, that's the way it would work. Now, I don't know what's stirring up within you, but, but I, I'd encourage you to resist this temptation to critique the scenario that Jesus is, is posing here, right? Uh, uh, you're, we're missing the point if we think, I would never talk to a servant like that. Number one, I wouldn't have a servant. And number two, I would never talk to a servant like that. Well, in the first century and in many places around the world in the 21st century, uh, that scenario would have made perfect sense. In verse 9, Jesus drives home the point. He says, does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? And the implied answer is what? No, you don't thank somebody for doing what is required. Uh, in this, this context of a master and a servant, uh, uh, thanks is, is reserved for those times when someone does something for you that wasn't required, something that wasn't deserved. The servants were only doing what was required. Now, again, this is very different from the way we tend to think about thanks. Uh, we have these, this common courteous, courtesy of saying thanks to anyone, anytime they do something uh, for us, even if that's their job. And this, this passage obviously isn't saying there's anything wrong with that. That's what I do. I, I love telling people, thank you. But in the context of a master and a servant, uh, you don't thank a servant who's done what was commanded. So what's the point of this scenario? I'm glad you're sitting down. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. And so this scenario, it's a, it's a vision for how we ought to think about ourselves after we've done everything Jesus has commanded. And so our conviction is to be, after we've obeyed Jesus, after we've served him, no matter what the cost to us, we shouldn't expect that he will thank us. No, he is our Lord, and we are his servants. We're only doing what was commanded. And this is the way Paul thought about himself. You probably noticed when Paul wrote a letter, the, the custom in that day was to sign, we sign our name at the bottom. The custom there was to, to sign your name at the top. And Paul often referred to himself as Paul, a servant of Jesus or a bond servant of Christ Jesus. For example, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. And so Paul was declaring up front that he and Timothy were loyal servants of Jesus. Jesus had given them commands. Jesus had given them assignments. And they gladly obeyed, no matter what it cost them, no matter where it took them. And so they didn't view Jesus' commands as suggestions. Jesus wasn't a consultant or an advisor who might give some options. No, he was their Lord who gave assignments. And he gave them commands that they gladly obeyed. They didn't consider commands to be burdensome or unreasonable. They trusted and obeyed him as their master. After all, they were pursuing this mission that Jesus gave the church, to go make disciples, baptizing them, and then doing what? Teaching them to obey everything that Jesus had commanded. The only way they could, could teach people to obey is if they themselves were learning to obey everything Jesus commanded. And so we need to be very clear about this. This is how we should think about ourselves as disciples. This first conviction is that we are unworthy servants. We are simply doing what our Lord commands. And so this is a statement about the Lordship of Christ. 
Uh, Jesus commented on one occasion, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? You say I'm Lord, but your life doesn't match up with it. And so this is a statement about the Lordship of Christ. And of course, the reason we acknowledge him as Lord is because he died as our substitute on the cross, paying for our sins, and he rose again on the third day, guaranteeing that if we're in Christ, we too experience this new life now and this resurrection in the future. And so Jesus, again, he's not our consultant, he's not our resource, he's not an advisor, he is our Lord. And I think you can see how this conviction about the Lordship of Jesus prepares us to give give thanks in the tough times. And so if we really do call him Lord from the heart, then Jesus has already done more for us than we could ever repay. If Jesus never did another thing for us, uh, he, we would never be, he would never be indebted to us, okay? He has already done uh, more than we could ever spend eternity giving him thanks for. So our thankfulness and our obedience are not depending on what he's done for us lately. And so we don't have the attitude, well, yeah, Jesus died for my sins, but what have you done for me lately? Hey, I'm having a tough time down here. Have you come through for me? Have you done these things I want? No, that's not our mentality because he is Lord, absolutely, period. Therefore, he deserves our thanks no matter what. Now, somebody who embodied this in the Bible was Job. Uh, some people think that, that Job was the first book in the Bible that was ever written. But um, Job was a righteous man. He was an obedient man. And after he lost everything, we're told in Job 1, he came and he fell down face on the ground and he worshiped. And he, his comment was, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Later, when he lost even his health, he said, shall we accept good from the hand of God and not adversity? And so for, for Job, uh, it was uh, worship and thanksgiving were equally appropriate when he had prosperity and when he lost everything. His circumstances were somewhat irrelevant. God deserved to be worshiped. God was worthy. God didn't owe him all of this abundance that he had. And so if we carry this conviction into the tough times in our lives, all sorts of possibilities for Thanksgiving open up. Open up. Uh, for example, James 1 tells us what? It says, when you encounter trials, consider it joy because God refines us through those trials. God gives us perseverance. And if you actually call Jesus Lord, then that's what you're going for, this capacity to be faithful, to persevere, to obey him, no matter what happens. And so if the tough times do that, thank God, right? When I think back to some of the tough times that I've experienced in my life, um, the, the toughest of times, uh, there's no way I'd want to rewind the clock and go back and relive those things. At the same time, the things God has done in my life, the freedom I got as a result of that, the lessons learned, man, those are priceless. And so did I thank God at the time when I was going through those things? Not always. I, I'm, I was not, am not as mature as I could be. But now when we experience tough times, we can thank God. If you're a follower of Christ, you can, you can thank him for what he will do. He never wastes a perfectly good trial to do something uh, deep in your life. He will refine you. And if you call him Lord, you can be thankful for that. And so um, this, is, this is a conviction. We're unworthy servants. We're simply doing what our Lord commands. Now, before we look at the second conviction, I want to make a somewhat subtle, but I think a very important point. Anytime you study a passage in the Bible, you need to be very careful to discern what question is this passage answering. And this passage is answering the question, how should we think about ourselves after we've been obedient. And so we think, I'm not a per, I'm not, I don't deserve anything from God. I should, I don't deserve his praise. I don't deserve anything. I'm only a servant doing what was commanded. So this passage doesn't answer the question, how does Jesus as our master treat us 
Okay, that's not what this passage is about. If you want the answer to that question, go to Luke 12, 35 through 40. And we don't have time to look at it here, but Jesus tells us that he's a master who treats us much, much better than we could ever deserve. As a matter of fact, he takes these same elements from this scenario and he says that at the return of Christ, Jesus, our master, he will do everything that this master is not expected to do. That if we serve him without expectation of being thanked and noticed, we will be thanked and noticed. If we serve him uh, with, that, with no expectation that we will be served by our master, that passage says he will serve us even though he is our master. And so this is the extravagant hospitality that we saw in Psalm 23. He prepares this table before us in the presence of our enemies. He, he anoints our head with oil, our cup overflows. He is that attentive, his, his hospitality is that lavish. And so uh, let that encourage you. Uh, but accept this conviction, but let that encourage you as you move forward. Well, the second paragraph explains this second conviction, and these two convictions are very much inter interrelated. And it explains how we should think about God if we want to be people who give thanks. Notice again how the men with leprosy appealed to Jesus. We read, on the way to Jerusalem, he, Jesus, was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And so they had obviously heard about Jesus. They, they had heard that he was this, this man who could do miraculous thing. He could even heal people of their diseases. And so they address him as a superior, right? They call him master. And what do they do? They don't demand anything. They ask him for mercy. And mercy, by definition, is never demanded. It's never deserved. It is freely given by someone. And so here's a scenario. Here's these 10 desperate men. Leprosy was a skin disease. Uh, it's not uh, terribly contagious, but, but for a variety of reasons, they were required to live apart from the community. So these 10 desperate men appealing to a superior, a master, and they are asking him for mercy, okay? So that's the scenario. And when he saw them, he said to them, verse 14, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. The law stipulated that if you felt like you were healed from a disease, you had to go to the priests and they would examine you. And if they, you were found to be healed, they could pronounce you clean. You could re-enter the community. You could re-enter worship at the temple. And so these men followed Jesus' instructions. Evidently, they believed at least that it was possible that when they got to the priests, they would be cleansed. And they were. They were healed as they went. Verse 15, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And so he wasn't timid about this, loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. And Samaritans were never the hero of the story unless Jesus was telling the story. Samaritans were kind of outcasts. They were outsiders to the Jews. Uh, they were the most unlikely people to enter the kingdom of God. But in the Gospel of Luke, the outsiders, the unlikely, those are the main people that got it. Those are the main people that understood this kingdom that Jesus was offering. And Jesus made sure that those who were with him didn't miss the irony of the situation. Then Jesus answered, verse 17, were not 10 cleansed, where are the nine? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. And so Jesus didn't say to this man, hey, don't mention it. I'm God in the flesh. I just do this sort of thing. You really shouldn't, shouldn't mention. He said, no, 10 out of 10 were healed. One out of 10 returned to give thanks. Remember the scenario Jesus, Jesus, Jesus established in the scenario that you only give thanks if something has been done for you that you don't deserve. 
Well, here was a master who had shown mercy that they didn't deserve, and so it's fully appropriate that they return and give thanks. And Jesus mentions the man faith, man's faith in verse 19. Giving thanks and glory to God is really a litmus test for saving faith. In Romans 1, when Paul was describing how uh, people reject God, just people reject God, even though they have overwhelming evidence in creation that he exists, his comment was that they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And so thanks, honor, glory, that's a litmus test of whether there's really saving faith. And so how should we think about God if we want to be people who give thanks even in the tough times? Well, our conviction is that God is a merciful master. Notice he, he shows mercy to us that we don't deserve. A merciful master who gives us what we don't deserve. And so again, that is fully appropriate. So since, since he is that type of master, it is fully appropriate that we be people that are overflowing with thanksgiving to him no matter what our circumstances. And if this is a, a difficult season for you, and I know from talking to people, it's not for everybody, but if it's a difficult season for you, especially, it's especially uh, strategic that you fix your eyes on Jesus, that you don't take your eyes off of him, that you don't forget what he's done for you. If you fix your eyes on Jesus, you'll remember that he has shown you the greatest possible mercy the greatest possible mercy. He's already done the, the greatest thing he could do by becoming one of us, by humbling himself, by being obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so we'd have plenty to thank him for all eternity if he never did another thing for us. But the fact of the matter is that he always does this type of thing. God didn't spare his one and only son for us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He gives us, gives, he lavishes his grace on us day after day after day. And so we will be full of thanksgiving if we notice those things. Remember Psalm 23, 4. Um, uh, David noticed God in the tough times. That's where David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so if you remember that, that Jesus is your good shepherd, then you will notice as well. You'll notice when he gives you rest, when he gives you nourishment, when he fights your battles for you as a good shepherd. You'll notice that when you take the wrong path and you're a lost sheep, he brings you back and puts you on paths of righteousness. You'll notice when he sets his table before you in the presence of your enemies, he gives you abundance. You'll notice when goodness and loving kindness are following you all the days of your life. If you notice those things, there will be no end to the thanksgiving that you can give to him. And so it's really not, Thanksgiving really shouldn't be a function of our circumstances. It's a function of who God is and who we are in relation to him. And so my encouragement to you is to dwell on these convictions, these two convictions this week. And if you want more details, we, we post this manuscript on our website. You can grab it beginning tomorrow morning. But you can rehearse these things throughout the week. Use these convictions to think rightly about yourself as a servant and rightly about God as a merciful master. Next week, Sam's going to teach from, from Colossians 3. This is an amazing passage where we're encouraged to notice what God does and then respond by giving thanks both in word and in deed. And so it's going to be a very practical, practical message about how to, how to live this out day by day. One last thing I want to mention uh, before uh, we sing is that one of the primary practices that helps us uh, helps these convictions take root in our heart is corporate worship gathering together when we worship when we gather together to worship it's like the things we kind of know in our mind and our hearts they come together and on an emotional level and on a deeper level than just thinking about this it connects with us and we become convinced in in the deep places of our heart and our mind that these things are true and i don't know if you noticed this, the songs we already sang today they expressed 
some, some, some aspects of these convictions that we've been talking about. And that's what, what music does. We worship through song, we worship through the word, through prayer, through confessions. But one thing song does is it helps, us, it's help these, helps these convictions go deeper into our lives. And, uh, and so um, these songs give voice to things that we might not think, we might not remember to express to God. And I was thinking about this week, and my heart goes out to those of you who haven't been able, for whatever reason, to worship corporately in eight months. Honestly, I can't imagine what my heart would be like if I were not able to worship for eight months. And so if that's you, if you're, if you're able to, only able to watch and join us online, I, I pray that you're able to worship these days. And my encouragement to you would be, no matter how awkward it is, if you're by yourself or with one or two or three other people, I would encourage you to sing when we sing and express these things to God. And so this is one of the things God gives the church is corporate worship. I can remember times when I've come to worship and I have noticed people that I know are going through tough times and yet they're singing like they mean it and they're singing from the heart. And I'm like, that's the best sermon I, need, I could have at that moment. Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of our worship. And, and there are times when I come to worship and I haven't been particularly obedient and we sing a song that confesses that and, and expresses this aspiration, you are Lord, I want to follow you. And that's one of the ways God brings me back. He renews my mind. He encourages me. He gives me, gives me the courage to keep seeking him. And so worship is a gift. Worship is a gift. I want to pray, and then we'll, we'll continue in worship this morning through song. God, we thank you for, for these passages we have. God, your word is true. It's insightful. It gives us ideas that we just don't have, ways of thinking that we haven't figured out. In other words, it reveals to us how we need to think. And I pray for each of us today that you will give us the mind of Christ as we go through tough times. I pray that we would recognize who we are and these, this conviction that we are your servants, you're our Lord, we pray that that would occupy a deep place in our hearts. And God, may we never think that you're stingy and reluctant to give us what we need. May we see you as a gracious master who continually gives us things we don't deserve. And God, may it overflow in thanksgiving, for you deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.